Oh, okay, as people are getting quiet, so I think it's time to get started. Um, my name's Josh Kelly, and I just want to welcome everyone here on behalf of Mountain True. We've, uh, along with all the folks on stage, helped uh, put these events together, and want to thank you all for being here. If you don't know much about Mountain True, we're an environmental organization. Uh, our founding organizations were, were founded in 1982 and 1984, respectively, so we've been active in this region for a long time. Uh, we have uh, program areas in clean water, uh, resilient forests, and healthy communities, and uh, work on all sorts of different issues like clean energy, clean air, et cetera. Um, myself, I'm a biologist, and I work on public land and forest issues. Uh, we decided to have these panel discussion events because there has been so much work done on the Nantahala Pisgah uh, National Forest, uh, forest Plan revision. Uh, so if, if you didn't know, the, there is a plan revision right now happening that will, uh, will shape the, the course of our forest for the next uh, decade or two at least. Um, and, you know, I just want to acknowledge that the Forest Service has done a great job and has, has, you know, have tons of talented people working on this. It's been five years. It started in 2013. And all these people on stage are examples uh, of some of the collaborative groups that have been, have been coming together. All, all of these people have been working constructively on uh, putting together a forest plan that works for a wide diversity of interests. And so this is a chance for them to say in their words what they want to hear uh, uh, or see in the forest uh, for the next 10 or 20 years. If any of you in the audience have, have participated in the plan revision, raise your hand. I want to see how many, how many folks out there. Quite a bit. How many folks in the audience are a member of a group that has participated in the forest plan revision? Great. I want you all to give yourselves a, a big round of applause, because uh, this has been a marathon. And, and I've got good news. This is probably the last year of forest plan revision. There will be a draft environmental impact statement this year, and after that, a decision. So this is the home stretch. And so hopefully, this event will inspire you all to stay involved and to get your friends and family involved and uh, to you know, give this, this forest the love it deserves. Um, I guess with that, um, I'm not sure that I have too much more to say, except for we're going to now turn it over to a couple other people. The, uh, the moderator tonight is Lee McMinn, who is the chair of the Transylvania County Natural Resources Council. Uh, before Lee comes up here, we're going to have Dave Casey, who's the district ranger of the Pisgah National Forest. And, I'm not sure if any of you have, or know Dave. I'm sure some of you do. I'm not, who all, not sure who all knows Dave. But Dave is a guy who's incredibly dedicated to this forest. He, he's worked on this forest in at least three different roles. He worked on the Grandfather Ranger District, left and went for, to, to Virginia, came back and worked on Nantahala National Forest for a number of years, left and went to Alabama, and then came back from Alabama because he loves this forest so much and this is where he wants to be. So I'm always uh, thankful when we have people in positions of power that really care about their responsibilities. There's no better example of that than Dave. So welcome Dave up to the, to the microphone. Well, it's great to see everybody here. Um, thank you for that introduction, Josh. And uh, I just, yeah, I am blown away to actually be able to work on the Pisgah Ranger District and follow in the footsteps of folks like Art and, uh, and Randy, I think, is in here somewhere, but uh, who are probably a lot more capable of bringing this message to me than me, but the, I'm the man right now. So anyway, we're here to discuss the forest plan, and I do hope this is the last year of forest planning. Um, so uh, hopefully that will be the case. So what is a forest plan? Um, basically, Everything we do on national forest system lands as the U.S. Forest Service has to be guided by a forest plan. Uh, Congress has basically mandated that we have that, every national forest, um, and we're no exception. So a forest plan guides us. It does not get extremely specific, um, such as a specific road or a site or something like that, but it gives the overall guidance that we, uh, that we have. Um, like Josh said, the intent is that it would govern what we do for the next 10 to 15 years. Um, the last forest plan was completed in 94. You can do the math. Sometimes we go past 15 years, but 10 to 15 years is the general goal. Um, and also just a note about as the U.S. Forest Service, we, are, we do manage national forest system lands with multiple uses in mind. So. Essentially what that means is we're never going to 
just manage national forest system lands for recreation, just for timber management, just for forest health, or anything like that. We're, we're essentially mandated to manage across the national forest for multiple uses. Obviously, we can't do the same thing or manage each acre for each use, but across the forest, we're, we're tasked with that. Um, as far as incorporating public input, uh, like Josh said, we started this, uh, this process in 2013 and essentially have been gathering public feedback ever since 2013 in various forms and fashions. Um, uh, and so basically at this point, we've taken that information and produced several different documents so far on what that, the building blocks of that forest plan could look like. You can see that on our website now. Um, and that'll be refined as we move forward. Um, and as you can imagine, especially just indicated by the attendants here tonight, we've received thousands of, of comments from private individuals like yourself, uh, collaborative organizations, um, just across the board, a whole lot of input that right now, essentially, the interdisciplinary team is taking and using to refine uh, the plan. Just, uh, you know, as, as Josh mentioned, there's a lot of folks here that have been engaged in this over the long haul. It's not for the faint of heart. Um, there has been a significant amount of investment of personal time, uh, personal energy, in some cases money, I'm sure, uh, as far as just participating in all the different activities associated with, with this forest planning effort. So we're very, very grateful for all that investment. Um, basically at this point, later on in the summer, as Josh mentioned, the plan is uh, to have a draft forest plan along with alternatives by the end of the summer. Um, that's, a, that's a goal there. And then essentially that will, that will indicate, that will give you a good picture of you know, the alternatives will include how this might affect wildlife, how it might affect uh, timber management, how it might affect recreation, any number of things. Um, and where there's a range of alternatives, you know, a lot of what we've done is we've gathered input. Obviously, folks are on some, there's some agreement on some topics, and then other topics, there's obviously a wide range of, of feelings across there. So when we produce this draft plan, it'll be reflective of that public input along with the best available science. So where there's, you know, opposite ends of the spectrum reflected in our draft plan, we'll produce that range of alternatives there um, just for consideration. So essentially when that draft plan comes out and the alternatives, that will then trigger a 90-day comment period. At that point, we'll be asking, once again, for public feedback on that draft plan. So that's very important. Um, as far as why we're even wanting public feedback on this, um, I probably don't need to tell you all since you're sitting here, but this is concerning our national forest. We're tasked with stewarding the land and managing the land, but it's not ours, um, it is all of ours. So it's critically important that, that we hear what y'all want, um, your desires, what you look to the National Forest for, um, providing to you, not to mention the rest of the citizens of this country. Um, and then as we, as we move forward, obviously there's gonna continue to be a high level of collaboration when we actually implement the forest plan. Um, like there has been for many years here in North Carolina. Um, and so with that, I will, uh, I will basically hand it over to Lee. I'll also point out, I'll be here the rest of the meeting, so will Alice Cohen. Uh, she has been eating and breathing forest plan revision for, for a while now, so we'll both stick around for the meeting. But thank you very much for the invitation and for allowing us to be here.
Welcome. Uh, the administrative announcement first, we're about reaching capacity in here. We put out some extra chairs in the back. If you're sitting in a row with empty seats in it, uh, could I ask you to cozy up? <laughs> I see a little bit of movement out there. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Lee McMinn. I've been the chairman of the Transylvania Natural Resources Council now for four years. It's been a it's been a pleasure to serve the uh, county and to work uh, very closely with the other members of the council. Uh, it was formed, the council was formed in uh, 2006 by the county commissioners for the purpose of inventorying our important natural resources, for making recommendations to the commissioners for how to manage those important resources, which ties us in very closely with the forest management plan for Pisgah and Nantahala. And the third thing we're supposed to do is to conduct uh, educational events to inform and elucidate the uh, public and to help them to manage the natural resources and appreciate the natural resources that our county prides itself on. Uh, so even though TNRC is not a sponsor of this event, it's certainly something that I would have asked to be on the <laughs> be on the headline for had Josh invited me to do that. Uh, you didn't introduce the panel, did you? Okay. Let me first do a brief introduction of the panel. Uh, Tom Thomas is uh, the president of uh, Backcountry Horsemen for North Carolina and a member of the North Carolina Horse Council. Fred Harden, hold up your hand. Good. Uh, Forrester and lead salesman with Gilkey Lubmer Company. Meg Sutton, sitting in the middle. Southern Blue Ridge Program Director of the Nature Conservancy. Uh, David Whitmire, a uh, stalwart of the fish and wildlife conservation, a chairman of that group, and the co-owner of Headwaters Outfitters, and also the uh, Rosman representative to Transylvania Natural Resources Council. Uh, last but definitely not least, Kevin Coburn, Natural Stewardship Director of American Whitewater. So, I'm going to give them each an opportunity to introduce themselves a little further and explain their organizations. But first, I want to remind everyone, uh, there were a bunch of these little white cards distributed in your chairs. Uh, they are for you to write your questions on. Uh, this, you can write your questions during the program, or if you have a specific question that you want answered now, then go ahead and write your question, and we'll pick it up. Who are the folks picking up the questions? There's several of them around the room. So as soon as you have your question written down, put your name on it, and I'll give you credit for writing it. Just hold your card up in the air, and uh, we'll come and get it. Okay, so starting with the introductions, each panelist will have three minutes to introduce you to themselves, to identify the group they represent, and provide some information about their personal history and the history of the uh, organization, and what are some of the most important issues uh, to their groups. What's a good forest plan look like to your group? and how they work with the stakeholders group to come up with collaborative ideas that serve everybody. So uh, first, Kevin, you want to do that? Sure. Yeah, can folks hear me? All right, great. Uh, so I'm Kevin Colburn. I'm the National Stewardship Director of American Whitewater. We're a national nonprofit based in Silva, but I work out of Asheville. Uh, we do river conservation and access work representing whitewater paddlers. And I'm also part of the Outdoor Alliance, which is a coalition of, of mountain biking groups, rock climbing groups, uh, hikers, backcountry skiers, and paddlers. So we're all the human-powered outdoor recreation groups. So um, I work really closely with Imba Sorba on mountain biking and uh, Access Fund on climbing, as well as my own constituency with paddling. So that's kind of the, the mindset I bring. Um, I'm a UNCA alum, so I've been here a while. and. Uh, cut my teeth collaborating on the, the dam flows, the flows from the Duke Power 
uh, hydropower projects here in Western North Carolina. So I learned the value of collaboration and working with stakeholders to get really meaningful local outcomes. And that's really what I brought to this project. I just really wanted to see um, outcomes that are, are profoundly beneficial for the communities surrounding the National Forest. And I definitely view the forest as the goose that uh, continues to lay the golden egg. You know, if you look around Brevard especially, you can see the, the economic footprint of the forest in the recreation economy. And I think that we can continue that for many, many years to come. It's a sustainable source of, of well-being and health for the communities around the forest. So that's really our goal. Uh, things that are near and dear to, to me in this process are uh, potential wild and scenic rivers that could come out of forest planning, um, all kinds of sustainable recreation initiatives like uh, better trails and uh, better communication with the public about whether it's a road being open or uh, trail conditions or any number of other things. Uh, water quality is certainly important to, to kayakers. We're sort of the canary in the coal mine. So uh, we definitely share that with trout fishermen where we like to see our, our rivers clean and cold coming out of the mountains. And forest planning has uh, a lot to offer in that regard. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you. Uh, David? I'd like to thank Mountain Tree for the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, David Whitmire with the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Council. Uh, my family's been in Transmitted County since the 1820s, and uh, my wife and I own uh, Headwaters Outfitters, been there for the past, uh, in our 26th year now. Uh, it's been a privilege to represent the sportsmen in this, uh, in this forest plan. We're one of the oldest user groups recognized in the forest. Uh, the FWCC is a uh, is a uh, nonprofit, but we're a, a grassroots organization. We uh, have a lot of different representation from the uh, Wild Turkey Federation, Rough Grouse Society. I'm a member of the North Carolina Bowhunter Association, but we also have a lot of individual sportsman members also. Uh, if anybody would like more information, I do have a booth over there. You're welcome to, to pick up and uh, get more information about what we're about. FWCC was formed in the uh, early 90s. Uh, a gentleman named Leonard Hardwood formed the uh, organization. Leonard worked on uh, forest issues and projects uh, throughout, uh, throughout the last 20 years. In 2014, when the forest revision plan started, uh, he asked me to step forward. I do have experience working with the Forest Service on forest permits. Have a lot of knowledge in recreation and history, so it, it was a good uh, a good fit for uh, me to step in and, and work on that. Uh, we've used the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission as our technical advisor on forest on our uh, wildlife management. Uh, we have used the Forest Service uh, as a technical advisor on the forest health issues. So we uh, and we've also got several uh, biologists from our uh, our club uh, members or the Wild Turkey Federation in the, in the Grouse Society has also helped. So we've been using good science base to, to work together on a plan. Uh, to get local input, we, uh, we started last, uh, last February when the draft was starting to be released. We, uh, we went through uh, and visited six different counties and met with over 400 sportsmen and brought the draft to, and got input from the sportsmen, which we thought was very important. Uh, through our, through our outreach, two of the uh, main things that come up was uh, lack of wildlife habitat and uh, access to the forest. So that was the two things that come up over our, our getting our input. And we look forward to, uh, we look forward to uh, moving forward with the, with the alternatives where we can, uh, can pick those out. So thank you all. Okay, thank you. Megan? Good evening. Um, so I work for the Nature Conservancy and I am based in Asheville. Um, I've been working for TNC for about 11 years. Um, I was born in Silva and have a lot of extended family all over Transylvania and Jackson County. Um, the Nature Conservancy's primary interest in the National Forest Plan that's going on here is to get ecological integrity kind of a big word that I'm going to be talking a little bit more about tonight. Um, and the restoration of ecological integrity prioritized in this plan revision process. Um, we focus, as do many, on the best available scientific information. 
um, uh, particularly as it relates to forest health and forest resiliency. And it became apparent to me fairly early on that um, my interest, my organization's interest, could be um, front and center in the forest plan. However, um, having that forest plan be implementable um, coming out of this was highly dependent upon it being a broadly supported plan. And that's when I really kind of stepped up my game on collaboration and really um, started spending a lot of time with these people up here um, and many more. And so I'm really excited to be here tonight to talk to you about this and kind of um, a little bit more specifics about what I think that is. And I'm really excited that to have a um, forest plan that presents all of our interests um, and kind of a win-win scenario so that we can all um, get what we would like to see in this plan. Okay, Fred? For most of you, more than just a few rows back, this is G-I-L-K-E-Y, not G-U-I-L-T-Y, lumber company. <laughs> As with the other sawmills in Western North Carolina, it's a family-owned business, been incorporated since 1953. We are not the largest sawmill in Rutherford County. Part number is by far much larger than we are. We impact directly 40 to 50 logger families every month. Forest products industry is the second largest economic driver in North Carolina. We supply hardwood, no pine, to domestic and export markets and have been for over 40 years in the export business. We have, I have, uh, family from Mills River. For those of you that are familiar with the big bottoms there at the intersection of the stoplight, that big old two-story house with the big shrubs going up around it, that's a Corpman farm. My father, when he was in Sparta, North Carolina, with his family, would come over to Mills River in the summer, and he would help them harvest, potatoes, corn, whatever. So for over 90 years, those bottoms have been cleared. It takes a lot of energy to keep land cleared. It doesn't provide a whole lot of habitat, but we've got to have food. Our forest, when harvested, are not cleared. We change the picture, we change the landscape, but we also change the benefits to all forest users, whether it be us producing lumber, birds, wildlife, as the forest age, those also change. We need young forest. We need multiple uses. We have not harvested timber on the Pisgah and Anahala now in over 10 years. Timber harvests have dropped to one-tenth of their level 20 years ago. We want to see these forests productive and also returning monies to the counties where this timber is harvested at a practical level. We know that not every acre is harvestable, and we don't want to see that. We're as much concerned about the land use and the renewable resources as everyone in this room, but certainly at a different scheme. I have been the victim of coming home and the forests that were in front of my house suddenly at ground level. I knew, and by the way, I do get mail and calls from Medicare every week right now. So that gives you an idea maybe where I am in age range. <laughs> to see that forest go from big shortleaf pine to flat on the ground, I knew then, having bought timber and harvested timber and helped sawmills for over 30 years, how that might impact now suddenly an adjoining landowner or just the public in general. There's nothing we can do to make a harvest pretty, but we can make the forest healthy by continuing a sustainable timber harvest level. Thank you. Okay, Tom. Good evening. Glad everybody uh, that's here is here and I uh, appreciate your interest. Uh, my name is Tom Thomas and I have the pleasure of coming to Transylvania County uh, almost 50 years ago now. Uh, and uh, as a student teacher, uh, then becoming a teacher in the school system for seven years and then I was an administrator. Uh, a principal in three of the schools, Brevard Elementary, Pisgah Forest, and T.C. Henderson up near Lake Toxaway. 
So I've had a chance to work with the human resource in Transylvania County, and I don't mind telling you, it is one fantastic resource. Uh, if you've, you've got a lot to be proud of uh, in Transylvania County. Uh, just a short correction, I should have done this earlier. I am no longer president of North Carolina uh, Horse Council. I'm the president of back, I mean, North, excuse me, let me reverse that. I'm no longer president of Backcountry Horsemen of North Carolina. I'm the president of the North Carolina Horse Council. And I am, the reason the mistake was made, I am past president of the Backcountry Horsemen of North Carolina. And I'm also uh, past executive uh, vice president of Backcountry Horsemen of America. Backcountry Horsemen of America started over 40 years ago in th three western states with 14 people. They were looking at the erosion and problems not only equestrians were causing, but the main problem was snow melt and rain coming after. And you can just listen to the flooding and the problems they're having in California right now. That facilitated what is known as backcountry horsemen. There were about seven states involved, uh, three at the beginning, seven for about 10 years. And now there are 33 states with backcountry horsemen groups working with boots on the ground to maintain trails and to make the resource a safe and healthier place, not only for the resource, but for the people that use it. Uh, it's an honor to be here with you folks tonight. Uh, if you want to meet the president of Pisgah Backcountry Horsemen, she's in the back of the room, so she'll be glad to talk to you. Um, we're in over a $2 billion industry equestrian industry in North Carolina alone. And we would like to see more of that money coming into our county. So uh, again, thank you for inviting me and look forward to your questions. Well, thank you. Tom, would you like to call out your uh, president? I would stand up and be recognized. Christine, Christine, thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, Tom, the first question will go to you. There is a perception of increased use and overuse of trails in the Transylvania County Forest. What causes trail erosion, and how should trail maintenance be reflected in the finished forest plan? Okay, well, that's a, that's a mouthful right there. Uh, how, many, uh, how many trail groups do you think the National Forest is paying for right now in our National Forest in North Carolina? Trail maintenance groups. Does anybody know? Zero. Zero. <laughs> Your trail maintenance groups are the Carolina Mountain Club, the Pisgah Hikers, uh, Backcountry Horsemen, Sorba, uh, and different groups that are coming together to say, gee, I wish somebody would do something, and then they realize we are somebody, so we're out there doing our best to maintain trails. Uh, our trails are getting used heavily. We're probably the most used national forest in the nation. And we have a biker increase, mountain bikers, uh, in the thousands. And even though uh, we all take our toll, as bikers do, horsemen do, hikers do, our main problem on trails is water. If we don't get the fast moving water off the trails, they are not sustainable. And a lot of our trails were on far lines to start with. Hopefully the plan will address that. I know they're looking at loop trails where there are no loop trails right now. They're looking at uh, things like uh, putting power equipment, which we're already using, to do rolling grade dips uh, along with silt bars and water bars on the trails. So uh, hopefully there will be some money coming in that direction, but we need your help. You are somebody, and we'd love to have you out there. Okay, before I ask if anyone else wants to address this topic, I'd like to put in a pitch for Pisgah Conservancy, yeah. who has a major project going right now to reroute and improve the Cantrell Creek Trail over in the Turkey Pen area. That trail was initially put in next to a stream and has since become the stream. <laughs> so, yeah, if you want a nice cold awakening, you know, take your bicycle or your boots out to the Cantrell Creek Trail and, and jump in. That's a good example because Trout Unlimited is very much involved with that also and mm -hmm. Backcountry Horsemen, along with Sorba, the biking group. Yes. Team effort is how we get it done. Exactly. Anyone else on the panel like to address this topic? Okay. 
first question from the audience then comes from Joyce Pearsall. She wants to know what in the plan uh, provides for the preservation of important archaeological sites in the Pisgah and Nantahala forests. Archaeological sites. Lee, that's always uh, considered in, in NEPA. Anytime they do a, uh, a project of any sort, that's always looked into. So archaeological is protected in, on, from trail building to timber. All that is, is always considered. OK. And I'd just say it's so protected that in the collaborative group, we can't even see it. So um, it's something that we, we talk about as an interest that we, you know, will be in the plan for sure, but it's not something we've dealt with to a high degree. And NEPA stands for? National Environmental Policy Act, which yes. is the process that all the big decisions like this have to go through federal land. Yeah. Speak close to the mics, please. And I think you, uh, and Kevin mentioned it, it is kind of secret. You don't want folks knowing where locations are mm -hmm. at, so. Now I just had somebody ask me where the swamp pinks were located. Yeah. Highly protected plant. All right, Kevin, you get the next one. American Whitewater promotes wild and scenic designation for eligible streams. What are some of the local streams that should be eligible for designation? And what types of values could wild and scenic designation help protect? Great. OK. So first of all, a wild and scenic eligible stream, it's just a list of streams in the forest plan that the forest offers some special management for. And it's really just good stream management. There's no dams allowed, and whatever values make that river special have to be protected in the plan. So that's, what, that's all it really is. And you, you know some. There's 10 on the forest right now, 10 eligible streams. And uh, locally, it's the Davidson, um, the North Mills River, South Mills River, uh, Big East Fork of the Pigeon. So those are four good examples out of the 10 of eligible mm. streams locally. And we think there should be more. Um, we think it's you know just an incredible asset here that we have in the Southern Appalachians to have the streams we do. Uh, we've uh, collaboratively, our groups have asked the Forest Service to consider some additional streams, and they did. Uh, they're proposing ten more uh, locally. Uh, some of the highlights, I think, uh, West Fork Pigeon along Highway 215 is just an outstanding stream. Um, the Thompson at River over on the kind of the escarpment. And the East Park of the Tuck coming out of Panther Town. So those are ones that the three that the um, Forest Service already says, we hear you, we think these are eligible, we want to move forward and offer them an additional level of protection. Uh, so you all can weigh in and ask for the Forest Service to either uh, really just go ahead and, and stamp those and make them eligible or add streams to the list. And uh, locally, I think a couple really strong candidates that they passed over would be the North Fork of the French Broad, right upstream of David's Place, and um, some of the tributaries in Panther Town Valley, which are just really exceptional little tannic streams. So uh, it's a great opportunity for folks to weigh in. And uh, it's values, not votes, on eligible streams. So tell the Forest Service special things about these streams that you know. Um, share your experiences with the Forest Service. Don't just say, I want them to be eligible. Okay, what types of protections would designations wild and scenic bring to the river? Yeah, so uh, two things basically no dams, uh, which is huge if you look out in the long term. So, no dams can be built, and whatever values are identified that make the river special, so rare, unique, or exemplary values, would have to be protected by the Forest Service in the plan. And that could be botanical values, fishing, other forms of recreation, um, scenic values, geology, it could be virtually anything. OK. Uh, this toss-up question comes from the audience again. Uh, Sheila Parrish asks, what attributed to the regrowth of the forest after the clear-cutting in the early 1900s? I guess the question is, how did the forest manage to survive, and how did it manage to recover and uh, regain its diversity? Brad, you want this one? I'll okay. try part of it. And before it gets when they're talking about the, the horse stuff, if you have not been outside of Rutherton to the Tryon International Equestrian Center that has been built and is in the process of continuing to build, take the time and go. It's like coming up to the Sierra Nevada Brewery. It's a fantastic 
experience that you just can't get otherwise going there. Fortunately for hardwood forest, cutting the timber is what makes new timber grow. You'll have regrowth from the roots that are in the ground, the seed that's in the ground, and the stumps that are left. A harvest is not a clearing. It's simply a change of habitat management. That was in part why we have the forest that we have now. The forests were overcut. We did not have the stream protection. We did not have many of the ecological environmental considerations that are in place on every harvest now on national land. Without harvest, we do not have healthy forest. The field I was talking about in Mills River, it takes a lot of energy to keep a field clear. When you cut timber, hardwood timber, it starts giving back then. It starts the regrowth process all over again. It is when the hardwood forests are allowed to overage that you start seeing the mortality that are now evident. We are losing ash trees. We've lost the hemlock. We're losing the red oaks and the white oaks. All these are just a part of forest health. But health can be manipulated not only with harvest, but also with controlled burns. But without the human interaction and impact on our national forest, what have contributed to so many beneficial uses, be it wildlife, be it hikers, be it campers, these will age out. We need timber harvesting on a sustainable level to continue to provide a renewal resource and not have to count on plastic or some byproduct. Does that help? As a follow-up question, uh, you can answer this one if you wish. Uh, do you currently consider uh, Nantahala and Pisgah to be healthy for us? And secondly, what provisions in the forest plan uh, would you like to see incorporated to see the restoration, to complete the restoration of the forest? These are really good questions. Um, so I would add to what Fred described. So yes, the forests were overcut. You know, the, the giant chestnut trees that we saw um, leaving on, you know, trains way back when or floating down the river. Um, the forests that we're left with today are generally fairly even aged. So that means they're all about the same age. So there's not a lot of um, age diversity. There is also, um, and interestingly, most of the forests we have today are middle-aged, much like maybe in this room. Um, there are a lot of middle-aged forests out there. There are very few young, which is something that David's going to talk about, and there are very few that are considered old growth, um, all of which are really important for forest health and resiliency and for a whole suite of wildlife species. So the other thing that our forests are having problem with is that they're um, what's considered closed. Um, it's difficult to see through them. So if you stand on one end and you want to see someone over there, you might see a lot of shrubs, you might see a lot of rhododendron and mountain laurel, and historically that was not the case. Um, and so we are lacking in what are called open forests or, or savannas or woodlands. So I would say the question is, are our forests healthy now? Um, to some degree, they are, they could be a lot healthier and they could be a lot more resilient to disturbance that we might see in the future. And I think I agree with Fred that um, active management, either through um, controlled burning and or through very targeted silviculture treatments are really very much needed in order to get us to a more healthy forest. Next question goes to David. What is early successional habitat and why is it good for wildlife? Why do hunters want more of it? What other forest user groups would benefit from more early successional habitat? Now that one, that one on my list, but... Uh... Now, early, early successional habitat is uh, young forest. Uh, the Forest Service considers that zero to uh, 20 years. Most productive within that is zero to 10 years. Most of your uh, Turkey Federation or Wildlife Resource Commission uh, actually <laughs> identifies early successional habit, habitat zero to 10 years. Uh, Fred mentioned this, we haven't done much cutting in the forest in the last 30 years due to capacity of the Forest Service to, to get it jo the job done. 
It's actually uh, representative is 0.06 across the landscape of early successional habitat. That's where our uh, populations of our deer have gone. They, they need browse, uh, and that's, uh, that's very underrepresented. Uh, our group has asked for 10 to 12 percent. We feel like that would be a, an incredible benefit to bring our, our deer populations back up. Uh, for the different species, of course, uh, deer browse is, is the main thing they eat. Everybody thinks uh, acorns is very important. That's about a three-month uh, ordeal there, but browse is a year-long thing. They need young shoots, uh, young plants to eat, and that's your browse. Uh, for bear, that means uh, soft mast in the spring. Bear are in people's trash cans. They can't find food in the forest. We need young mast. We need deer populations brought back for the, for the bear to have also. They eat a lot of young deer. Uh, for grouse, it's very critical to have uh, early successional at higher elevations. Uh, grouse is one of our special birds that are, is in very much in trouble now. So, uh, For hunters, uh, wildlife populations are very important for our uh, sustainable use. Uh, over the both forest in 2016, there was uh, over 250,000 quarter pound servings of meals just from the big game taken on these forests, so it's very important. And a uh, corner phrase from Teddy Roosevelt, uh, you know, the, the wildlife can't speak for itself, so I think the hunters are having to do a lot of speaking for the wildlife. And a follow-up question. What other forest user groups will benefit from uh, early secessional forest, and how should that be reflected in the forest plan? Have any bird watchers out there? Your diversity of bird watching will tremendously go up. Uh, and, and many other species benefit. Your pollinators, uh, you, your bees are in trouble nowadays and you, and you get them close to houses and around insecticides. More interior, we keep these, uh, these wild bee colonies will be able to, to enjoy that. So a lot of those uses, I think the revenue that we get from the timber that we can put back into trailheads and trail maintenance also can be a benefit from the, the financial of it. Okay. This is another toss up question from Rick Thomas. How do you restore old growth after it is cut to establish a more young forest uh, habitat for hunting? I, probably, you want to well, the definition concept, whatever, of old growth, um, it's not the West Coast versus East Coast. Old growth is a stage of many different vegetative forms. We have set asides at now areas that will not be harvested. Now they may burn, they may have other issues, but they will not be harvested. These will age into old growth over time. It's not something you can just say, in this window we will make this happen. But we have to realize the forest is growing and aging every day, and it will outlive all of us. So that's where the old growth concept and understanding of what does the old growth really bring back to the forest and to the forest users needs to be further defined and understood to make happen. Go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, so it was pretty interesting in one of our collaborative groups we, we talked a lot about the, the drive towards younger forest and other interests that want older forests. And it kind of seemed like, like on a social values level, we were, we were really far apart. So we actually tried to put it on a map. We said, you know, what, what places in the forest are really ideal, are old now and, and could get older and, and become really rich old growth habitat? And which, which parts of the forest do we think probably is, is really great for younger forest, like changing the forest through active management. And we thought it was going to be all this conflict and like, you know, it was just be this bright red map of, of conflict. And instead, it was something like 17% of the forest where we kind of had a disagreement, you know, and, and the rest of the forest, we, we kind of said, yeah, that's, that should probably be allowed to get older and that should probably kind of be nudged younger. So um, we feel like there's room on the forest for both, um, for some of the forest to get older, and some of the forests to get younger. It's 1.1 million acres. It's a lot of forest. Okay, thank you. Uh, this one I'm not sure we can handle on the panel, so if anybody in the audience might have an answer, a short answer, they'd be welcome to address it. 
Uh, does the Forest Service still implement a stampage tax on logging sales that benefits local economies? Yes or no? Dave Casey. <laughs> No, no, that's all you. <laughs> so with timber sales, basically um, the Secure Rural Schools Act, and I am not going to get into detail on that. You can Google that later. <laughs> <laughs> But essentially, there are returns that go to each county based on a formula. Um, and they, each county had a decision point several years ago on what formula they were going to choose, whether it was going to be based on historical or current uh, timber sale revenues. So anyway, there are returns that go to counties from timber sale revenues, if that's the broad question. Thank you. Not bad for being surprised. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Fred, uh, the forest has been used, uh, the forest has used timber harvest to create young forest habitat for decades. Do you think there is an opportunity for timber harvesters and other wood products businesses to help with and profit from ecological restoration work, similar to how they have with wildlife habitat projects? Absolutely, but all the pot farmers aren't going to be happy. <laughs> A series of roads that keeps our forest open to a number of different concepts and actual businesses that are out there that we didn't see 40, 50 years ago. Look at furniture that's now made from vines and tables that are made from slabs and um, the benefits of uh, the people that come uh, for, for ramp, uh, the ramp festival. Uh, yes, there are certainly. Uh, these go hand in hand. Without one, you really can't have the other. The forest cannot be everything to all users all the time. In order to benefit those different needs, whether it be the, uh, the start of young forest or the benefits that we will get from having the tourists and the hikers and the backcountry folks that want to get into the old remote forest areas. And by the way, all big trees are not old trees and all little trees are not young trees. Uh, some of the timber that we harvest now and that we run through the mill, you get 20, 24, 26 inch diameter poplar that's not 60, 70 years old. It all, a lot of it depends on the site. These sites also have benefits to different users. So the silvicultural aspects working together can help really all of the users. Okay, a follow up. What other silviculture groups are we talking about here? What other groups rely on uh, flora from the forest, from harvesting forest products? Um, herbs, um, gathers. Um, Galax. Yeah, Galax mushrooms. Mm -hmm. um, Megan, you can grab a mic if you want. I see you there busy there. Firewood. <laughs> Firewood. Okay. And, All right. And I will say that. Uh, Timber harvesting is, is it's very dangerous business. It's, it's one of the top insurer costs of industry. To go in and fell big trees requires a man on the ground. You cannot do it with the equipment that you get when you get east of I-77. So to go in and, and pocket select or whatever to drop trees to help create habitat, it's expensive. So the money needs to come from the forest if at all possible and not rely on our budget that is already way overstrained. Okay. Now this next question from the audience I'm going to address to Kevin. It is from Will Ebal. Did I say that right? Okay, thank you. Uh, how are the impacts of mountain bike use on forest trails measured? Are they measured? I don't know if I'm the best person to answer this question. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, so the new forest planning rule, first of all, which is this new plan will be under, it does have a monitoring requirement. And one of the things we're, we're probably going to be working on next is what does that monitoring plan look like on the forest? And how do we how do we pay for it too? I mean, I think that's a that's a problem. You know, monitoring costs money, and it's not quite as as like uh, fancy and easy to do, I guess, as planning is. Um, do other folks have more? Tom might answer that better than me, actually. Well, I've I've had the pleasure of uh, working in Pisco for 46, 48 years, uh, and one of the things that has happened, and that's why this question in particular is very hard to answer. Uh, how many, I'll, I'll ask you folks, how many bikes do you think were in the National Forest in 1995? <laughs> Not very many. Hmm? Maybe a couple going down to do some fly fishing. Okay, and we virtually have thousands now. Uh, that is a quick growth. It's a very economically good growth, uh, but it does have its challenges on trail maintenance. Uh, I know the trail groups are coming together, along with the breweries. <laughs> and have put some large sums of money together uh, to help renovate these trails that uh, they're using. Uh, there are challenges. I'm not going to lie to you about that. Uh, but the, the bottom line is uh, it's, it's going to take trail crews, uh, paid and otherwise, uh, which is a total change for the National Forest Service. Uh, by the way, in 1995, recreation wasn't even mentioned in Washington, D.C when the Commander-in-Chief was given his five major goals for National Forest. A lot has changed in that time. We'll see, with a new plan, we should have a monitoring device for all groups. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, this one is for Tom. One of the big issues identified in forest plan revision has been a lack of sufficient maintenance for trails and a lack of loop trail opportunities as previously mentioned. What are some of the best strategies you have heard for building and maintaining the trail system uh, that the public wants? What is backcountry and how is it managed and how would this be reflected in the finished plan? Okay, uh, first of all, backcountry includes just about anything from your backyard uh, throughout the national forest, national parks. They're, that's all backcountry. Uh, it gets specific when you're talking about a wilderness area because it has a very special designation. National parks have designations also that are different than national forest. But when you're just talking about backcountry, you're talking about all of it. Uh, generally, when we talk about Pisgah National Forest, we talk about backcountry and wilderness as two separate issues. In the wilderness, we have to go in with axes and crosscut saws. It's all old school. We get a lot done, and it's manageable here. Uh, and they manage it in places like uh, Bob Marshall Wilderness, which we could take all our wildernesses here in the east and stick it in the corner of Bob Marshall. Uh, so it is doable. Uh, forest service land, we can use chainsaws on, we can use machinery on. Uh, in the past, we haven't, I guess, 95 or so, we didn't have machinery on the National Forest. We did it all with hazel hose and plaskies. Uh, but with the onset of more and more recreation coming to the National Forest, to get the water off the trail, and again, I mentioned to you, the biggest damage done on trails is by water, fast-moving water. Uh, we have to get that water off the trail with berms, soap bars, whatever we need to use to get it off the trails. I hope that helps. Anyone else? Okay, this one from Anonymous in the audience. How many Anonymous do we have out there? <laughs> By 2055, WNC could have 5 to 10 percent less precipitation, 2 to 5 degrees higher temperature, and 75 percent more lightning. How is climate change reflected in the plan, especially fire? So I think that's a really good question, and I think that's something that the agency is grappling with. Um, that, too, was not something that was addressed the last time that the plan was revised. I think a lot of the, the climate modeling um, that's coming out 
is showing lots of different trajectories, but all of those point to the fact that our forests need to be more resilient. Because yes, it could be hotter and drier, it could be cooler and wetter. We don't exactly know, but we do know that we're gonna have more um, larger events. So either you know larger rain events, larger wildfires, larger um, different natural uh, events. And so we need to build resiliency into our forests. And one of the ways that we can do that, or the primary mechanism for doing that, is looking at ecological integrity. And that really has four um, components. You look at the structure of the forest, you look at the composition of the species, you look at whether or not the processes and functions of that forest um, can, can happen, and then you also look at how well connected it is. So there's also a fire component to that, and I think that the agency has just been given a lot of national guidance on how to deal with wildfire um, in forest plan revision, and I think that they're just really getting down into those weeds. Um, and I would, I don't know if Dave or others know more about that that you would want to say. Okay, this is a follow-up question from the audience. Uh, how can we mitigate forest fire risks by timber harvest to deal with wildfire prevention? Go ahead, David. Well, a few years ago, or two years ago, we had some uh, pretty severe wildfires. Of course, it was a lightning strike fire in a lot of areas, and we both, uh, we all know that lightning strike in this part of the country is tough, because a lot of times you can't light a fire if you want to. But uh, we've seen a lot of our uh, infrastructure, our roads, and this kind of goes back to, to what Tom's uh, question there on backcountry. Uh, we, we need to protect our roads, we need to daylight our roads, which will create early successional habitat, but we need to use those as fire breaks. Uh, we've got a lot of communities now that live around this forest, and to uh, have to go in once a fire starts and, and, and create these fire breaks, we could do that ahead of time, create early successional habitat. So I think we need to prepare for these events, and I think that's a huge thing is, is our road structure, which we have throughout the, throughout the forest, especially in, in Pisgah. Some areas don't have roads, which is more, leans to more backcountry, but if you've got, if you've got roads. Also in your backcountry, the management on that, you're only allowed to cut a, a small diameter tree, so you, you really need to, to watch that also, so. I would also add um, two things. One, I think that you can, you know, one way to get rid of fuel is to cut it down, which is what the question was asking about. Another way is to burn it up. So you can do controlled fires or controlled burns in strategic places to minimize the fuel risks of, of wildfire. That is certainly something that I think that the agency is, you know, very engaged in. The other thing that I would add is that it's also, um, you know, we've had a lot of development pressure in Western North Carolina, and there are a lot more communities that are built right up next to the national forest than, than there has been in any time preceding this. And so I think that there are also um, mitigating things that communities can do to decrease the risk of their property and or a fire on an adjacent national forest from coming onto their property. Okay, thank you. Uh, this one's for Kevin. Uh, Pisgah National Forest is the second most visited national forest and mountain biking is the fastest growing outdoor sport. How can the new forest plan prepare for the increased mountain bike use we all know is coming? Sure, yeah, we've talked about this a lot actually in our collaborative <clears throat> meetings. So um, first of all, I think it's a pretty good problem to have that people wanna come to the forest and, and recreate, you know, and you can see this in Brevard with the economic footprint of mountain biking, you know, with the hub and with, you know, just all the businesses that are associated with it. So it has some benefits. Um, one of the things we've talked about doing is uh, providing some some kind of off ramps into the forest that is outside of Brevard. <laughs> so if you're coming from Hickory or Charlotte, maybe there should be more opportunities developed by Wilson Creek somewhere. You know, to have an area that attracts people with high quality trails that are sustainably built um, that lets people spread out a little bit more. You know, and we've talked about it. Um, there, um, also out in Graham County, you know, or Robbinsville, you, you guys have a lot of people that come to Brevard. 
Graham County would love just like 10% of them. Like send, send them, they're like, we'll, we'll work with you, just send them, send them our way. Um, so that's really the big thing is providing alternative opportunities elsewhere. And then, you know, just recognizing it as a value here. Um, and we've, uh, we've talked a lot about having a recreational user council as well, which would be made up of, of all the different types of recreation representatives from the forest, including hiking and biking and horseback riding, to try to uh, eliminate or minimize user conflict and, and plan and just like be a, a kind of a unified voice for the Forest Service where we cut through uh, potential conflicts between uses on trails. Okay, as a follow-up question from the audience, has a yearly user fee been considered for each individual user of the National Forest? Can try that? You may. This is one of those things that uh, uh, can make headlines and talk about making a forest trail from North Carolina to Florida. Uh, yes, it's in discussion. Uh, it should be. Uh, a lot of folks I know will say, I paid my tax dollars for the National Forest. It's up to our legislators to give us an adequate amount to support what we put in with taxes and to support our National Forest. Uh, and I agree with that understanding. Uh, right now, I don't see that happening. Uh, whether you're pro or uh, negative on the leadership, uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's just, I think it's a matter of fact that we're not going to see that for a while. So if you want to take care of your national forest, a user fee might be a good way to go. I don't know if it is or not. I don't think the Forest Service knows it is or not. But I think you folks, the people that love and care for the forest, need to make that decision. That's something I would like to see the general public push forward if they feel that it'd be a good thing. Uh, how it be organized, there's so much to be involved with it. It is under discussion, but there's nothing in black and white, but I'm sure they would love to hear your opinion on it. Okay. Yeah, just to add to that a little bit, I don't think it's, it is something that gets talked about a lot. I don't think it's anything that's been uh, proposed and it's not in the, the, like the forest plan documents we've seen so far. So it's not, it's not something that's, you know, kind of on the list right now, but it is something that, that does get talked about, and it is a problem. Um, for now, I'd say that, you know, a good way to, to kind of counter that is through voluntary donations to people that are doing work on the forest. If I may, just very quickly, Pisca Conservancy is a newborn in our area, and is, it was born months ago, and it's already 21 years old. Uh, it is going great guns. It's got good leadership. Uh, a lot of different organizations belong to it. Uh, many of you are going around with license plates with Pisgah Conservancy on it. That money stays in Pisgah District, not all of Pisgah Forest. And it seems to be working very well. Uh, John Cunningham's leadership has been outstanding, and I think anybody that's seen what's taken place uh, has a good reason to be proud of it. So that's one way our revenue can stay with our forest. Go ahead, David. Uh, Sportsman's been paying their way for, for many years. It's worked good for us. We have a game land use permit. It's up to $15 a year. So uh, and it's worked for us very well. If you're going to hunt and fish on the National Forest or on game lands in North Carolina, you do pay your, your share, pay your way. So, Okay. Uh, this one is for Kevin, Tom, and David. So we'll get a panel response and see their collaboration and work here. Mountain bike races are one of the many uses that contribute to erosion on trails, but, can, but create revenue for the Forest Service and the community. What are race organizers in general doing to contribute to trail maintenance? How could races be more sustainable? And how could the forest plan address these issues? Well, um, my mountain biking friends that are in Imba and Sorba, they tell me that the, the best, um, the most sustainable races are going to happen on the best sustainable trails, and that the trails that are built, the trails that are on the forest right now are not the same as modern trails built to modern mountain biking standards. So one of the great ways to minimize the impacts of races is just to, to 
convert or some trails, at least on the forest over time, to higher quality, modernly modern designed mountain bike trails. So that's that's one idea. Uh, before we get to another, what types of different uh, trail construction techniques or features would you like to see? You brought it up. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I can help you out on that one. Uh, Thanks, Tom. <laughs> this, is how, this is how it works, collaboration in action. Yeah. There you go. Uh, well, first thing, bridges instead of going through streams. Uh, if, if you go to a lot of the trails now, you'll see we're actually bikers and equestrians have built bridges so bikes and horses either one are not going through the streams uh, that's part of it armoring that means putting down rock uh, gravel or if you've been on north mills river uh, you've seen a lot of that uh, going into and out of the stream to prevent erosion uh, from causing more silt to go into the stream uh, backcountry horsemen have packed in gravel to small streams uh, in the backcountry to create fish beds to facilitate uh, a better habitat. Uh, but the armoring of them, uh, the key I think is we're, you don't want to build, we're a national forest for everybody. So you're not building, quote, a biking trail. You should be building a multi use trail, a trail that is sustainable for all uses. That's the highest level you can build and the easiest to maintain, and everyone would be using it, horses, bikes, and so on. I will tell you this about bike races. Uh, we were concerned about it as equestrians, having a bike come around a corner and not being respectful getting off. I've heard hikers say the same thing. When they're having a biking race, we have gotten with them. They have biking numbers on them. If they're ever rude to anybody out in the forest, you take their number down, and they'll be disqualified from that race, their whole team. That's one way they're facilitating good courtesy as well as still keeping the race going. Anyone else? Uh, the organizers I know, Lee, they do a, a good job of working with Sorb and a lot of the other groups, so they do, uh, they do put their time back in. Um, as a permit holder myself, I know when they do permit, some of their funds go back into the forest program itself, which is, which is beneficial. Uh, it's tough on a on an organizer because you know the amount of rainfall we have in the county here. I've always thought uh, it, it might be very beneficial when when they did have bad trail conditions if they could adapt to a two track more of the roads if they had a backup way. It's hard to put a, a race off to the next weekend. There's other things going on, so if they could adapt over, I think the Forest Service also does a pretty good job about holding them accountable. I think if they are damaged after a, a, a race, that they do expect the organizer to go back. And Kevin mentioned the recreational use uh, group that, uh, that's forming through the plan. I think that's a good way to address a lot of the, the issues. Okay, so better trails, accountability of race organizers uh, should all be in the new forest plan? Question. Yes, no, indifferent? Well, we've, we've definitely said that um, trails should be a priority and that public access should be a priority. So, you know, the, the, the plan can't say build trail X at a higher standard. The trail can say things like, um, you know, uh, have a goal of building, of bringing more trails up to a higher standard for multi-use. And that is something we're absolutely asking for and I think we will see in the plan. Okay. Now I have my own question. It's not on the cards. Uh, every year, uh, we seem to kill about a handful or less of people on our waterfalls. Uh, is waterfall planning, uh, waterfall mitigation, uh, waterfall safety, uh, is that an item that you all have discussed in your stakeholders group? And what would that look like in the forest plan? And Clark, this one's for you. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's a. I don't think it's the Forest Service's total job to to make the forest safe for for the users. I think it's our, our job as outfitters, uh, the Transylvania Town. I mean, it's a public education. The Forest Service can do so much with public education, but we don't want fences around all of our waterfalls. That's that's not going to get it. So it's it's an education thing more than any 
a few years ago, it's not a high water issue. I mean, we had some of the, we had a drought and, and lost six people. So I think it's an education thing. Uh, tell folks when you see them in the wood, you know, explain to them when you see them around the waterfalls. But, uh, you know, it's a sad thing, but I don't think, I don't think situations like that can tend to be addressed in, a, in a, any type of forest plan. And I'll grant that point to you. There is a reason there is a Darwin Award. <laughs> I was going to say that, but I didn't know if it was politically correct. You it couldn't have worded it any right? better. Okay, this question from Paul Faith in the audience. Uh, what endangered species are in the forest, and how are they doing? How does the plan overlap with ESA? Paul, would you tell me what an ESA is? Okay, thank you. So I'll, I'll take this one. Um, the National Forest Planning Rule um, that was adopted in 2012 has very specific guidelines for each forest. When they go through the plan revision, they have to identify species of conservation concern. And um, it's interesting because many national forests, um, you know, have in the tens here we have in the hundreds, I've heard it's over 300 um, of species of conservation concern. This area is ripe with endemic, threatened and endangered species of all kinds, plants, animals, um, and all sorts of other uh, wildlife, be it you know a salamander, a bug, um, or a moss, fungi. Um, and the agency is required to go through a very detailed process of consultation with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, as, uh, as well as through a very detailed process with these, in regards to these species of conservation concern, um, that to identify what are their needs, what are their population trends, how are they addressing them, and it's very rigorous. So I would say that, and I don't know if, there be any other additions? Yeah, and just to point out, uh, kudzu and rhododendron laurel are not endangered by any means. Multiflora, <laughs> <laughs> uh, multiflora, rose, multi -floor rose. Multi -floor coyotes. Rose. Who would have thought coyotes would be an issue here ten years ago? I have a cousin that professional beef farmer in Allegheny County. One of the greatest concerns he had were the groundhogs. Cow steps in a groundhog hole, breaks its leg, there you got five hundred, six hundred dollars. Haven't seen a cow I'm sorry, haven't seen a groundhog on his farm in almost two years. The coyotes can go down in the burrows and get the young. So a good thing, a bad thing. Depends on your point of view. But our forests have definitely not just plants, but also other wildlife species, plant flora that are at, at, causing us to be at great risk if they're allowed to continue um, unchecked and un unmonitored. So as well as endangered species, we have, we are in danger possibly of overpopulation in specific ones? Is that your point, Fred? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this question is for uh, you, Fred, and Megan again. How can national forests help sustain local forest product businesses in the future? Is it possible for timber harvest and protection of wild areas to be complementary? And I believe the term we're using today is collaborative. Sure, absolutely. Um, I think that they have to be linked. Ecological restoration management activities have to be either economically viable, them and of themselves, or they have to be paired with other activities that are economically viable. Um, and I think that there's so much restoration, forest restoration need on our national forests. Um, and that coupled with the fact that there's 1.1 million acres, I have no doubt that there is space for all of our interests to um, meet the, the ecological restoration targets, the timber targets, as well as the desire for protection of wild areas. Um, and I feel like with the creativity and ingenuity that we've seen in collaboration, projects can be developed that will accomplish these multiple goals. To put in a modern day sawmill that can be effective in 
purchasing the cost of the timber, ought, it's going to cost you between 10 and $15 million. A log loader is $280,000. You cannot put an effective logging crew together unless you've got about a million dollars. Without timber base to be knowing that there is going to be a harvest level that can sustain, sustain those businesses, you can't plan to be there in the future. So yes, these do have to work hand in hand. All of the wildlife interest, all the tourism interest, these all work together. Thanks in part to the foresight of others and to the continued effort of folks like here today. If we can work together, we can provide a base that encourages continued development and growth of the forest products industry so that the other users can also benefit. Anyone else? Okay, this question from the audience from Dale Soros. Uh, is the need for parking areas for forest user groups addressed in this forest plan, and can you be specific? Uh, parking is an issue in the forest. Let's be up front with that. It's a toss-up, so anybody can take it. Well, I'll start out. Uh, it is being addressed. Uh, it was one of the first major uh, recommendations when they first met some 10 years ago, uh, and it's always come up over and over again. Whether you're a hiker, biker, or equestrian, uh, parking is limited uh, in a tremendous way. Uh, we feel it very strongly needs to be done, uh, and again, we'll kick out and uh, we'll work on it. Uh, we'll, we'll try to make a difference. Uh, we have a camp now off of Yellow Gap Road called Wolf Ford Horse Camp, uh, and I take a lot of pride in that because backcountry horsemen, along with the Forest Service uh, and the North Carolina Horse Council, uh, developed that camp uh, because there was no parking there for, for horse trailers. Uh, back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, you could park a horse trailer on any gravel road. The traffic was not that great, and you could move out from there. Right now, uh, there's restricted parking, and it needs to be thought about by an engineer, developed appropriately, so endangered species and the area is used appropriately. Uh, we have 18 camps in our area. They're out there all the time, and uh, they need parking too. It's a shared forest, and it makes it tough. But uh, yes, parking lots are addressed. Okay. Uh, does that include roadside camping? The roadside camping they're looking at, uh, some of it will be closed in the sense that it's right next to a stream, and along with food waste, human waste, it, uh, has to be prevented from going in there. Uh, so uh, they're looking at, they're, they're not looking at, the beautiful part of this plan is they're not looking at little pieces. They're looking at the whole spectrum, what is good, what is bad, and how to make it better for everyone. And uh, I don't know if I'd want their job, but th that's it, and they're doing a pretty good job with it. Mm -hmm. uh, so far, I haven't heard hikers or campers mentioned other than this question from John Doe. Oh, would anybody care to address that? Uh, well, I, most definitely. Hikers are the largest group that's using Pisgah Forest as well as campers, by far. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it wasn't for the, the hiking groups such as Carolina Mountain Club, uh, staying in the mountains, a uh, uh, sea trail, uh, and building a, a tremendous amount of it. Uh, again, it's it, backcountry horsemen was formed to support these groups. Nato Hale hiking groups got over 220 members, uh, and they're out there day in and day out working in the forest, making uh, the Appalachian Trail, their shelters, their privies, all a better place for humans to enjoy the backcountry. So uh, we couldn't do it without the hikers. No way. OK. OK, this question is for David. Do you have some ideas about how timber harvest can be sensitive and complementary to other interests? Well, I think first and foremost, we need to uh, educate our, our users to support active management. It's tough sell when you, when you know personally that your uh, deer in Pisgah National Forest is probably at a historic low. And, and folks that live around their house see a lot of them in their backyard and eating all their flowers. But, you know, it's, it's an education process. So for folks to be able to support active management, they need to, to be educated on there is a need. So I think uh, 
by placing signage. We used to use signage up on uh, Yellow Gap Road. You folks, they're, they're kind of grown, grown in now, but uh, if you go through there, it'll, it'll show the forest health and the wildlife health regions we're doing uh, management. Uh, there's already buffers and designations in place, scenic designation, uh, stream designation, those are already in place. So for sensitive areas, that's already in consideration when they do a timber harvest. Um, I think it's very beneficial to know the, the use, if they're planning a timber harvest somewhere, you need to know the use that's going on there. Maybe the fact that we can uh, build a parking area or a trailhead, uh, you know, maybe where the logging part takes part. So. I think it's very important to know the use that is going on. Uh, any time you reset a forest, it's not going to look very pretty. It's hard to, if you look at a, a, a cut right when you first do it, yes, it looks boom, there you know, there it is. But you, you can look up driving up Davison River right now, you can look at the, uh, the hemlocks dying up there, and that is a reset. That will affect users. They'll be at one point. You know, folks are going to have to worry about the trees falling, and and any any reset will help. So I think it's uh, I think everybody needs to be contra many any of the users on there. So it's just not uh, it's just not a timber harvest. It can be resetting in any way it can can affect the users there. So first again, education on why we're doing things. I think it'd be a go a long ways. Okay, uh, Kevin, this one is for you from Eric Julian. How can we better protect wild fish populations? Yeah, well, um, sedimentation is a pretty major issue in some of our streams, and roads are the primary source of sedimentation. So it's a really hard issue because all of us that, that love to recreate on the forest, we need roads. Uh, we use roads all the time to get out there. So, you know, the forest plan, one of the things it has to address is road maintenance and how to, how to keep up a sustainable road system that reduces sediment inputs into the streams. And it's something a lot of us are are concerned about, and I think that the the Forest Service is going to have have to deal with. Um, that doesn't mean roads need to be closed necessarily. It just means that they they need to be managed really well. So I think that's probably the the primary risk to to fish at this point. Okay, I have one more toss up question. Uh, have, how have limitations of funding from Congress affected the Forest Service? How would Better funding affect what you'd ask for in this plan, and uh, does your plan comprise mainly a wish list, or is it an actual plan that can be implemented over the next 10 to 20 years? Nobody? <laughs> all, all of us. <laughs> I, I will say one thing about it. So I think it's a really good question. Um, the planning rule requires there to be some fiscal constraint in the objectives that the agency is putting out, saying, you know, we will do X number of acres of whatever it might be. However, we have found in our collaboration that that is really difficult because of limited budgets, um, capacity that's been decreasing over the last few decades within the agency, and it doesn't leave a lot of room for negotiation. Everybody wants to see a little bit more of whatever it is that they want to see, and all of it costs money. So the way that um, some groups have, have gone about making suggestions to the agency is trying to have like a base objective, which is considered fiscally constrained. We will do X number of acres of Y. And then also, regarding that same thing, they can say, and if additional resources come to the, are brought to the table, then we will do A, B, and C related to that same interest. And so that gives us some motivation to volunteer, to raise money, to come up with innovative ways to help the agency do the work that we would really like to see. And we have found that that has been able to catalyze our ability to negotiate, and because we all want to see more of whatever it is we want to see, um, without anyone having to, you know, go down to a level that they don't feel is adequate. And so when we talk about a win-win forest plan, that's a huge component of it, is the ability to stretch 
you know, uh, beyond the fiscal constraint of, of what they're seeing today and beyond the capacity that they have today. Okay, before I ask the last question, I had, I've got, a, reply to, I had a reply to that quick. Do you have a reply? Yeah. You're going to rebut that? No, I, I, no. Okay, Megan, did, David. Me, uh, Megan did a great job on, uh, on bringing out the stretch goals uh, to this. We found early on uh, we wouldn't be at the table if it wasn't for stretch goals. The fire service uh, said that they were going from 600 acres a year across both of these two forests up to maybe 1,600, 1,800 acres. Keep in mind, they haven't done work in 30 years. Early successional habitat is growing every year. We, we spent four years and wasn't going to get it done. Uh, we asked for the, uh, through the 2014 uh, Farm Bill, the Good Neighbor Authority, which allows our state agencies to go to work. So if it wasn't for, for that, not much reason for us to continue collaborating. So uh, if we can put our sportsman dollars to work in these forests, it'll be huge. The Robinson Pittman money is uh, is 20, over twenty million dollars come back to the state last year. So uh, we hope to be leveraging of those money. So there is good hope for for habitat work, and it's going to be uh, it's going to be an ongoing thing to to bring that uh, resource to it. Okay, thank you. Uh, before I ask the last question, I have five uh, more questions from the audience that I'm going to just acknowledge. Uh, this one from Tom Sweeney. What is the current budget? Is there money for the potential new initiatives? And who sets the budget? Tom, that's a very technical question. Uh, I don't think uh, there's a lot of panel members up here that are expert in the federal budgeting process. Uh, what I'm going to ask is that you get in touch with Dave Casey or one of his minions out there at the uh, uh, ranger station. And uh, I'm sure he'll be really glad to give you a, an introduction into federal budget setting, which is kind of like making sausage, if you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, from Sheila Parrish, is there a plan that helps all wildlife in the agenda that Mountain True is working on? Uh, Mountain True is not by itself in working on this plan. There are 30 some odd, I believe, different groups of Mountain True is one of them. Mountain True is your host tonight, and for that, I think they deserve a round of applause. <laughs> but you've all heard tonight that the uh, uh, management plan the Forest Service is trying to put together is aimed at bringing all of these groups and interests together in something that is called a win-win. In other words, everybody leaves the room happy. Uh, from James Singleton, I hear a lot about controlled burns. Isn't it hard to get a successful burn in WNC? How effective then are they? Uh, well, as far as a, the Cherokee, this goes back to the Cherokee used to, used to uh, control uh, wildlife with controlled burns. Uh, so they are very effective. Uh, let's see, hard to get a successful burn? Uh, well, I'll take you back to last spring. Uh, when we had wildfires all over the western North Carolina. Uh, most of them were set by arson, not lightning. So it's hard, but it's not impossible to get a good fire going out here. Yeah, that is being toyed with, I believe. It doesn't come out of the Forest Service. It's come out of the House of Representatives. And uh, I believe that our... Uh, Western North Carolina representative was one of the sponsors of this uh, this thing. He, the, the intention was to streamline the uh, study, the number of studies and the length of time that it takes to bring a project to completion. So uh, this one I would again defer on the local level out to the ranger station. Uh, other questions we can take up at a different time. Uh, sorry, Jim, that's a very, I really feel like I'm soft peddling this, but it's not. It's an important issue. And this one from Anonymous, if we do not reach a win-win forest plan that all major interests can support, what do you think will be the outcome for management of the forest? And I believe that's a pretty good final question that I'll toss up to the panel. You want to start at this end? Sure. I'll make uh, my comment pretty short and sweet. Uh, to, we have a kind of a slogan that just says, together is how we make a difference. 
backcountry horsemen believe putting boots on the ground and not only doing our fair share of cutting timber off the trail, doing trail maintenance, uh, but we believe in helping every other group succeed in their work. Without that initiative, together we won't make a difference. And we need everybody that uh, can possibly work on it in some way, shape, or form uh, to become a part of it. Chewing on each other and not compromising gets you nowhere. Have you watched the federal government lately? <laughs> yeah, if, if we can agree on a local level with the local users, the people that really know the forest, and we're not counting on a decision mandated by Washington, our forest and our population and all users will greatly benefit. If we cannot, then yes, there is absolutely deep concern ahead. I think we can do this. We have seen uh, just a tremendous amount of input, positive input, uh, concepts have changed, ideas have changed, and this can be put off. Um, but we've got to make this thing come together and let this stay um, local decisions by local folks. I would just say I don't think that's an option. Um, there You're have been referring to failure. Yeah, I don't think it's an option. We have invested so much time, effort, and energy into this process, and I can't imagine that being for naught. Um, and so I think that we may not get all, no one will get everything that they want, but we will all get enough of what we need, is my hope. And I think in order to have a plan that we can actually implement, we have to have that broad support. So I just don't think it's an option. I think a lot of our win-win may have already occurred. They have already got probably, uh, I think the Forest Service said, the most input from any national forest plan ever. So that is, that's fantastic. I mean, people have come to the table and they've uh, put, their, uh, put their input in, and I think that's, I think that's a big part of the win-win of the we'll see. But we also got to keep in mind that uh, the forest health and the wildlife health is held in public trust, and uh, all the win-win needs to come together. But these folks are going to, have to these managers are going to do the best. It's for the resource. David read my notes. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah. He can't read your oh, he can't read my writing. Yeah, I mean, so we've been meeting for years, and the Forest Service has staffed like every meeting we've had, and it's just an incredible investment of energy and intellect on the part of the Forest Service. And they've got probably the best planning team in the whole country that I've ever worked with, just incredibly bright, passionate people. So they've, they have been listening, and we've seen it all along. They've been releasing these, um, they call it under construction kind of pre-planned documents. And we can see our thoughts and ideas in them. Not all of our ideas, because not all of our ideas are good. Um, but we've, we see the work that we're doing. Um, it will unquestionably be part of the plan. A lot of the solutions we worked out will unquestionably be part of the plan. Uh, the places on the landscape where we've, we've kind of overwhelmingly agreed should go one direction or the other, I think we'll see. So I think we have already won in a lot of those win-win opportunities. And I also want to add that the collaborative group, we don't think we're the, the end. We're not writing the plan, right? I mean, everybody in this room has a voice in the forest plan, and whether you're in the collaborative or not. So people in, in New York that come here, and it's like the pilot of their year to come down here and go hiking, they have a role in the plan too. So we're providing our best ideas. Forest Service, you know, they're a smart team. They're thinking about our ideas. They're taking your input, input from around the country, and they're going to they're gonna give us something. I think it's going to be good. A public input is a very vital uh, aspect of any of this planning process, and it's been open since the day it started years ago. Uh, when the next batch of maps come out, there will be another public input period. But if you got something you want to say about it right now, you're welcome to do that. And any time between now and then, I believe they're supposed to be out in September. Alice, where are you? Midsummer, end of summer. Stand up so everybody gets a look at you, Alice. So uh, it is a, a very detailed and uh, 
comprehensive, sometimes exhausting process to go through, but as you see, the win-win is possible. And with input from you and your stakeholders groups and anywhere else the Forest Service can get an idea, they're welcome to it. So with that, it's been my pleasure to moderate this panel for you. Uh, very illustrious group of speakers. I hope it's been informative to you, and I hope it helps. And I'm going to turn this over to Josh so he can close it. Well, uh, thanks, Lee, and thanks to all the panelists, and uh, thanks to everyone who came. Uh, I want to let everybody know that if you provided your email, you'll get a follow-up survey so you can let us know what you liked about this and what you didn't, how any future events can be better. And I'd also invite folks, if, if you like this event, consider joining Mountain True. We're, we're all about bringing people together to find solutions to make our uh, mountains a better place to live. And so uh, thanks to everybody for coming out, and thanks especially to the panelists and to Lee.